This is the Magic Word Podcast.com. Hello, this is Scott Wells for the Magic Word Podcast.com. Right over here. <laughs> That's it. Hey, listen, we got a new set. How do you like it? Kind of uh, cool. I want to thank also those who are the friends of the Magic Word. They're the ones who have helped make this possible so we can have something a little bit different to present to you here as we're going a little bit more towards the video side of this. I hope that you kind of enjoy this too. So I'm uh, kind of uh, do something a little bit different here this week then as well. But again, I want to thank the Friends of the Magic Word and those are the ones, again, who pledge their financial support or give us donations from time to time. And I want to thank each and every one of them uh, for doing that. And also for you, the listener, coming back and listening to this every week. And thank you for subscribing. What? You haven't subscribed yet? Well, you need to do that. Just go down below over here and subscribe to this channel. So you can pause it right now and hit subscribe, or you can probably do it while you're still watching the video. But please subscribe to this YouTube channel. That will help us a lot. Also, I want to, as I said, if you are not a member of the Friends of the Magic Word, again, I want to thank them. But if you go to themagicwordpodcast.com, there you will see a link where you can join the Friends of the Magic Word and also watch a short video, find out why it is that we can certainly use your financial support. Well, as I said, we're going to be doing something just a little bit different here this week then as well, and that's going to be something that has to do with uh, our guest, Mr. Las Vegas himself. There it is. Uh, that's uh, Jeff Hobson. Going to put him up over in the corner over there, so this way you can kind of see some of the uh, short video I have uh, of him from uh, YouTube, so you can kind of watch a little bit of his presentation. You can't hear him because you're listening to me talk then right now, but Jeff and I have been friends for quite some time, and he is as, as you know, a very funny guy, has starred in The Illusionist as their Master of Ceremonies. He also has, as I said, Mr. Las Vegas, where he is the MC for so many shows in Las Vegas, uh, and uh, or, or was, and then again, he kind of was touring around with The Illusionist. He worked in for a while uh, with Mark uh, Kalin and Ginger in uh, working with the Carnival of Wonders, in which he was the Joker and kind of a funny guy, as well as the MC or ringmaster for their Carnival of Wonders. Anyhow, just a uh, uh, has a plethora of uh, talents and a very funny man and he's a good golfer too by the way and he now oper owns and operates Marvin's Magic Theater out in La Quinta California and we'll be talking about all of that oh and by the way I don't want you to forget but at the end of this video there will be an additional bonus footage for those of you who are watching this on YouTube then right now where Jeff will give us a personal tour of Marvin's Magic Theater. So you want to stick around and watch that. This is available only here on YouTube. We're not going to be playing that on the audio portion of the podcast. So don't miss that either. I'm not going to uh, spoil any more of this. I want to get right to it because I know that you're going to enjoy my conversation this week with my friend and yours, <laughs> Mr. MC of Las Vegas, Mr. Jeff Hobson, here on The Magic Word. Today I have with me a very special guest, someone I have known for a long number of years. We were just chatting beforehand, and he said about 35 years. That sounds about right. About sometime, I think, perhaps in the 80s, perhaps when we first got together and played some golf and hung out the Magic Island here in Houston and uh, have been friends and see each other uh, in, on his spectacular and astronomical rise to the uh, level where he is then right now, which uh, he is, I've always referred to him as Mr. Las Vegas, but he's living in California, which makes no sense to me right now. Well, actually it will when we kind of get into this conversation. Please welcome uh, my friend, Mr. Jeff Hobson. Hi there, Jeff. How are you, man? Oh, wait. Oh, I hear the applause now. Here, oh, sorry. Is. That's me. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Hi. Zen oh, applause, one hand clapping. Exactly. That's what that is. <laughs> exactly. How are you doing, Scott? I'm doing fantastic. So good to uh, to see you. Uh, yeah, as I said, you've always been Mr. Vegas, and then you went out to California. I know, you, of course, in between there was the Illusionist and World Tours and all kinds of stuff that you had done, uh, being the, the MC for, for Las Vegas. I really... Boy, as I said, you know, kind of going back uh, to to the Magic Island days, uh, and you were uh, performing then. That had to be, I want to say, maybe eighty eight, eighty nine, somewhere in there ish. So uh, I think I started with about eighty seven, and did a few different years. Came back uh, subsequent seasons there, and did a few yeah. weeks, a few weeks there. It was always fun. I, I loved it, and uh, 
Of course, Hollingsworth, you did the interview with him, and yeah. that was fantastic. I love that. I haven't seen him in so long, and it was like a little reunion in my head. I loved I loved the Magic Island, both the one in Houston and the one in, um, was it Laguna Niguel or something like that? It was in, oh, golly, not you said that. I want to say like Long Beach. It was San, not Santa Monica. Uh, um, it was it'll come San Diego-ish. It was down that away. Uh, it was. Uh, let me ask you a question. I've Although I'd never... Well, I was a house magician there, the one in Houston. What is the difference between the two of those? Although uh, being owned by the same place, but... Yeah, well, you know, here's the thing is that, you know, as we all know, the Houston one was a pyramid and, and built from the ground up, you know, uh, whereas the one uh, in California was sort of retrofitted into a regular s sort of normal strip mall space. Huh. So it had a different feel to it. There was a lot of the same Egyptian motifs everywhere, uh, the same feel with the furniture and whatnot, but uh, uh, it, it had a lot of the same pluses. And uh, obviously the one in, in, in Houston, you know, it was bigger and had a little more, you know, tricks uh, to it, if you would. So it, it was fun. Both both were good, though. Both are great, great venues. Yeah, I think the idea originally was for them to have some sort of a, a Magic Island kind of uh, model that would be built and it would go they after the they proved the success of the model in Houston they would go to Chicago Atlanta and Washington DC area you know different places so there would be then ultimately a nice route for magicians to get booked from one place to the other you had all these clubs and everything yeah and that was the first time I had met and worked with uh, Jack Goldfinger and Dove Mm -hmm. And uh, I got the best advice. I, if, if anyone knows Goldfinger, has anyone talked to him? You know, he always, uh, for some reason, he's like one of these geniuses where he whatever is. he says is like a piece of gold. He's and, a guru. You know, it's like wonderful. And, and he said, I, I was really upset backstage with something. And I was really mad or something, which I normally don't get. But I was mad at this time after a show. And he came up to me and he says, Jeff, Jeff, on one hand, you got hot. On the other hand, you got cold. You got to be cool. And I just thought that was like the best. I said, you know what? I go, I just, the way he said it, I just laughed. And I said, I said, Jack, you're right. And he called me right down and we were friends ever since. <laughs> you sound just like him. I can hear him uh, saying <laughs> something like that. Whenever I speak with him, it, 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 again, it's kind of like listening to a guru. I mean, he just yeah. has, he drops these little gems along the yeah. way. I, yeah. I talk with him a couple of times at the Magic Castle. I'm working out there. We go down to the library and, and we'll be talking for a little bit and he'll say something. And it's like, oh man, I just feel like just studying at, the, at his feet and not saying anything. Just listen to him talk. Yes, yes. You know? uh, a lot of really great ideas and things that he's had. Um, and then I, I we, we, we played a lot of golf and also, and I know like in Colon that you go and play at the, uh, Colon Open. We played uh, partners there a few times. Yes. Now, you know, I, I, I started that with Alveoli and I, Did you? I named it originally the Open Colon. Okay. To, to a little bit of a play on words. Exactly. Which, yeah. Colin entertainment pleasure. But then eventually became the Colon Open. I said, no, I, the other way around is better. But, you know. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I played there a few times. Matter of fact, I haven't played probably. 20 years I'm or more. I think I only did it three times, played three times because I was so busy doing things. Mm -hmm. I'm playing this year. Uh, so, yeah, I, I, I get to, uh, you know, have a, a reunion of sorts. It'll be fun. I'll be there. Maybe we partner up then again. Damn. Because uh, uh, I think the last time I might have played with Michael Finney was in my cart, and the time before that, I think it was you. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I know this year in August is going to be just a, a great convention again. Uh, he always puts on, I don't know what number, 80 or something. It's uh, about that. Yeah, I think it's 79 or 80, whatever. But, gee, uh -huh. you who would have thought it would have gone, you know, still gone on as long as it has? And and now, you know, they, they're, you know, O'Colin, Michigan was always known as the magic capital of the world, but now, it sort of really is because where can you find what four now magic companies in a quarter square mile? You know, it's just within a couple of blocks of each other, basically. Yeah, yeah, it's amazing. <laughs> it is amazing. I did, and, and uh, besides that, it's a place where magicians go to die. Yes, <laughs> yes, they do, and and in more ways than one. Yes, I I just set them up, man. <laughs> I, I've seen plenty of acts over the decades at Abbotson, just like any other convention, you know, you're going to have some good ones and you're going to have some people that are going, whoa, what the hell are you even doing on stage? You know, so yeah.
Uh, yeah, but uh, there at Colon uh, Cemetery, at the uh, Lakewood Cemetery, is uh, I, I know that Al has the book on the Magic Cemetery, yeah, it's, and it's he's constantly book. updating that. Yeah, it is a good yeah. book. Yeah, he, he, matter of fact, he was just updating it just this past fall, so I think a new version's coming out. It is, and in fact, he's hoping to have that. Uh, this might be a little bit of a preview. Uh, I don't know if he's announced that yet, but there should be one, hopefully, being released, I believe, at this year's convention in August there at, at Abbott's. Right, that'll be good. Uh, so, yeah, it is just a, uh, a really good um, uh, thing that he does, of course, with the tours and everything. It's amazing uh, who all is there. I just recently had purchased a, uh, a plot as well. I've been wanting to do that after my wife passed a few years ago. I had asked her about that, and she said, well, why do you want to go? Should we go there? Because uh, our kids won't come. And I said, well, even if they're you know, here in Texas, I don't think they would come necessarily regularly. Whereas here, I believe at least once a year, or people who make pilgrimages, magicians in the future will be going by and um, and at least reading our names, you know, yeah, at no, that point. I think it'd be a great thing to keep calling on the map, you know, I, you know, that'll, that'll do it, I think. So yeah. it's, the more the merrier, I guess. I guess. <laughs> so I've got a plot right next to Walter Blaney and right behind uh, Phil Wilmarth and kind of near David Linsell right there. Yeah. So uh, are you thinking about going there or you got? You know, I haven't gotten to the point yet in my life where I'm going, you know, I want to think about where I'm buried yet. Um, <laughs> okay. I, I'm not I'm not quite there, although my father-in-law does have four plots in southern Michigan a family thing that he's kept in for a couple generations. And I, I'm like, I, I'm not so sure. I don't know. Uh, the rest of my family's all been cremated. My uncle was a, you know, that was a little bit of a sad thing. We, on his way to a funeral, we cremated him, had his remains, and it was in a snowstorm. Uh, and the hearse got stuck, and we had to use the ashes to get the hearse out of the, the, the stuff, you know, snow. So, yeah, it was, it was, it was, not, it was not a good thing. <laughs> But you wouldn't be where you were without treading on Great Uncle Bob. That's right, <laughs> Uncle Bill. Thanks, uh, Uncle Bill. Sorry. Uh, so, switching subject for just a minute, I want to congratulate you for being a man ahead of your time, way ahead of your time, because many years ago in Vegas you had the uh, uh, virtual lectures before people were doing virtual lectures or online lectures or for that matter uh, and, I, and I, it was before dvds i think you still yeah. were doing uh, just video vcrs and everything and yeah. you had people coming you had a regular studio and uh, was it michael uh, who was it lauren michaels was lauren working with you Peter michaels yep yeah uh, and so you had a, a regular crew and you had a lot of really great talent who'd come in and uh, done these lectures and well before Murphy's and Penguin or were even around, let alone starting to do any kind of videos. I mean, you were just, I, I want to say perha perhaps that um, Joe Stevens was doing his videos, but it was, this was a different kind of a setup because yeah. you started doing this, I think, online. So tell me a little bit about uh, your model. Well, it was just an idea that uh, Lauren and I were talking about at a, you know, at a bar, you know, over a drink sort of a thing. We said, hey, you know, would it be cool if we could have just online lectures? Just forget about, you know, tapes and this and that and this. Anyone around the world can see it all at once, live, real time, ask questions, real time. And we yeah. went, yeah, that'd be cool. So we started looking at different uh, different formats and equipment. And uh, we, you know, we actually uh, built with our hands. I mean, sawed the wood. I mean, <laughs> everything we put up uh, the walls, uh, divider walls, uh, this special um, uh, drywall that was insulating for sound rooms. We put that up, we painted it all green, green screened it, uh, and we were learning about green screen, which was very you know, archaic at the time. Yeah. Uh, we had all the best cameras. We had our, you know, we had five different cameras above, sides, everywhere. Uh, we had this thing called a TriCaster, which was quite a piece of equipment that allowed you that transcoded the video to go online. Uh, and of course, the one, you know, the one big mistake of marketing is we didn't find out how many people were actually, uh, you know, was able to be able to see, see these and had some broadband in their house. What year would that have been? Huh? What year was that that it started? This was 2007. So, okay. And so uh, we found out that people had a lot of dial up at the time and people had small, you know, slow, but, but to really do this correctly, you really need to have some good, you know, good speed. And I guess a lot of people just didn't have it or they didn't know what it really was. And, um, uh, but we, we did it and we did quite a few lectures, which actually I have now 
you know, on my website, you can see them pretty much all. I'm loading them up as, as the years have gone by. Um, Hobson'sChoiceMagic.com. If you just join up on my website, it's all free. You know, so uh, you can see all those lectures right there. Mm -hmm. um, and you can see me quite a bit younger, you know, uh, then. And uh, uh, it was never age. You still look young. It was a bit ahead. However, one interesting thing was we were, I hired this whiz kid. Uh, his name was Jeff, and I said, "Look, we need something. We need a super fast computer that transcodes and you know does all this." And funny enough, we got to the point where there was almost no latency anywhere in the world. It was like down to like almost nothing. Which as now, that's quite a thing to do with no latency as we are now. But right. years ago, it was like non-existent. You had to wait a minute or two or ten or five or whatever it was to get up to speed. And we had Toshiba and Sony looking at us, trying to figure out what we were doing. We were in meetings with them, and they're looking at the box, and they're like, can we see inside the box? And we're like, no, you can't look inside the box. <laughs> you know, it's like a magic trick. It's a secret. We're not going to yeah. tell you. Well, it was just a matter of about two years, and then they caught up with us, and we, uh, you know, me, about 85000 in an investment sort of down the tubes because we just couldn't. I needed 200, I don't know, 150 subscribers, and we... And we only got about, we got less than 100. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, nowadays it would be quite different. But, yeah, we had a great time, a lot of great lectures, uh, and, and they're still all available to be seen. What would you say the guy's first name was that was helping you that had the idea for the uh, latency issue? Oh, Jeff? Jeff. Jeff. Well, yeah. Did he go on and create Amazon? Was that Jeff Bezos? <laughs> uh -huh. Sounds like a brilliant guy. <laughs> no, I wish it was. No, this guy was a 22-year-old kid that I just interviewed, and you know he knew everything about computers. That was him. But no, it wasn't Bezos. It would have been. Would have been. I I'm missing out on a few trillion dollars here somewhere. <laughs> it just sounded like that he had such a great idea, and these companies were coming in wanting to see what he's doing. That he probably had that kind of creativity and that kind of a mind. I thought maybe he went on to some greatness. Like, uh, no, no. I, actually, I we we parted ways, and I hadn't seen him since. That's interesting. Well, I remember way back then, of course, that you were getting ready to do something else. I think that was when you were starting to work with the V Show, and around that time, also, is that right? Right. Uh, I was jumping from show to show. I'd never really been out of work in Vegas. I was always, you know, whenever I, I moved in, um, you know, early 90s, uh, a year after I was married in 92, 93, I had an offer to do Spellbound, uh, which was at Harrah's under Dick mm -hmm. Foster Productions. And yeah, and then that show led four years in that show, then another four years at this show, then another four years at that. And it seemed like four years was the magic number for me. <laughs> I always seemed to, I don't know why. And then, you know, a lot of these places, every time I left one, they'd implode it. So I thought it was me. Um, <laughs> but, you know, finally, uh, yeah, we got to V, the Ultimate Variety Show, somewhere around the two, right after 9-11, uh, uh, he started the show. Uh, so like 2001, 2002, uh, started that show. And, uh, yeah, I was in that show for about four years, uh, mm -hmm. a good four years. And then I quit that show because uh, uh, I decided to go on to other things. Yeah, I, uh, I mentioned that because I remember coming out to Vegas at the time you were thinking about uh, selling that uh, that concept of the lectures, and I was seriously considering doing that, and my wife was a dental right. hygienist, Yeah, she was going to uh, come out, she was going to get a license to uh, practice as a hygienist, work for a dentist, and uh, we didn't get to the point of looking for houses, but I came out and uh, seriously considered making the move at that yeah, time. And I, rem I remember us talking about that, that's right, yeah, because I, I thought you'd be the perfect person to do it, too, so there you go. And now well, you're actually doing it uh, bigger, bigger and better than what, uh, you know, what we ever had. So it's good. You're doing a good job, Scott. Well, here we go. Yeah, yeah I remember uh, having a martini and a cigar at that fantastic hotel. It was uh, uh, where a lot of people hung out from the Cirque after. What was that? Uh, the rant? What's the hotel? The, well, there's a Paris that has a great cigar bar. But no, no, no. This was a place that was late at night. Was, these two guys had had fixed up the place, uh, and people from the Cirque and different uh, performers would go after work, like after midnight, and hang out there at the bar. And they had all these uh, paintings, like a Van Gogh and everybody on the walls yeah, and well, things. Oh, well, the, the Artisan. That's it, the Artisan. Thank you. Yes, which is still a boutique hotel, and it, and I yes, that's correct. Uh, and it was quite a great. I don't even know if it's still there. It's still there, but I don't know if they still have the cigar you know, area, but that was a fantastic, I should go back and do that when I, yeah, good idea. I'm going to yeah. go back. I just have a good memories of that. That was such a cool place. 
uh, you know, sitting in there. Uh, so anyhow, yeah, working with V and all of that, when you went from one show to the other, I know, did you work ever at the Greek Isle with that? Uh... Yeah, I sure did. World's Greatest Magic Show. I'd worked at, uh, was it two or three different locations? It started off at the Sahara. Yeah. Uh, and uh, they uh, were very heavy on the union people, and Dick uh, Feeney couldn't handle you know, hiring two backstage supervisors, which sat down and read a paper while the show went on. So it was one of those things, you know, where there's a dozen other people standing around not doing anything. It's like, look, we need three people. Why do we have 23? You yeah. know, so it was one of those things that that uh, that's why he moved on to another location. Um, because I think you had told me towards the end of that, I mean, they kept getting paying less and less to the point that they just basically said, if you want to come and work for free and use Las Vegas as a credit, you can come and be in the show kind of a thing. Yeah, Las Vegas sort of got that way after a while. Well, you know, here's the thing, you know, uh, uh, way back in the 80s, you know, when Cirque started, that was sort of like the beginning of, of for entertainers. That wasn't a good thing because Cirque du Soleil, uh, they got in, you know, all their acrobats from either Russia or China and they were paid like 200 bucks a week. Um, wow. You know, and, uh, and that's probably a lot of money for them, I guess. That was there. Horrible. They just wanted to work Vegas and have a great time, you know. Uh, and of course, they got it for real cheap. And then they figured, well, if all these great people are working for nothing, uh, why not get the rest of the acts? Uh -huh. And we're in offering less and less. And uh, even Anthony Gatto, you know, the world's greatest juggler, in my opinion, yeah. uh, in many other people's opinion, mm -hmm. uh, he was offered for God, it was probably 10 years. You know, hey, can you do Cirque du Soleil? And he's, how much money? And he goes, nope. And it took him 10 years to finally pay him enough money. Uh, mm -hmm. That was his regular fee. Hmm. Wow. Yeah, he, he was uh, and is uh, certainly great and, uh, and and touring around. For a while, you also were uh, doing cruise ships. And did you put together the Illusionarium? Was that what it was? Yes. Okay. The uh, uh, yeah, it was Norwegian cruise line that, uh, matter of fact, uh, Ron Wilson from the Magic Castle called me. Yeah. After I had been absent, I haven't been in L.A. or there, and I've been in Vegas for years. And he says, hey, uh, you know, Norwegian's uh, asking for you to come back and headline this new ship. And I said, oh, all right. It's this big epic. And it was the largest cruise ship at the time. I got plenty of stories of that one if you want. <laughs> we got time. <laughs> uh, yes, we do. But uh, anyways, uh, yeah. So I said, well, I don't know. What's the money? And then they, he quoted a fee that was even double what I would have charged. Uh, and I went, heck yeah, you know, let's mm -hmm. do it. So next thing you know, I'm there for a couple seasons. And then they come to me and say, uh, the entertainment director said to me, hey, uh, I want to pitch a new show. Do you have an idea for a show that's going to go into this circus environment? You know, around? And I said, yeah, give me a couple days. And within a couple days, I pecked out the, uh, the show, sent it to him. And he goes, wow, this is great. Yeah, let's do it. And so we got together storyboards and all this sort of stuff. And I pitched it. And, and not, I, wasn't even, I wasn't even like maybe three pages into a 10-page script. And the owner of the company, the CEO, says, stop, we're going to do this. This is great. Okay. And I said, and I was sort of disappointed because I worked six months on this presentation. I wanted to go, no, shut up, people. I want to tell you, you know. I go, no, you want to see these cool pictures? <laughs> so finally I said, okay, uh, righty then. Let's do it. And, uh, and, uh, but here, here's, what, here's a good lesson for a lot of people in business. You know, I always... Uh, you know, we all know that sometimes if you don't charge enough, you're not worth it. You know, it's like if it's a cheap hunt, couple hundred dollar magician, sometimes a company will go, no, you know, unless mm -hmm. it's a good price, then they'll think you're worth it. Right. Well, I designed the show so that it wasn't that expensive. These special effects I knew that we could do with lighting and uh, different type of special effects around the room. Uh, that would be relatively cheap. It wasn't really mechanically or, you know, otherwise tech heavy. Well, they said, well, no, we're going to do this, this, and this. We're going to get these mapping projectors that cost 50 grand a piece, and we need six of them. And we need this guy to come in and this company come in. We're going to spend a million dollars on this. We're going to, and I said, wow, really? I go, I already told you how to do it for 50,000 bucks, but if you want to spend two, two and a half million, I guess you can. It's you know, whatever. <laughs> uh, and funny enough, the after on the first day of the show, uh, one of the board of directors guys come up and goes, "You know, I don't know about all this." I go, 
I think your idea was better. We should have stuck with the original idea. And I'm like, yeah, I know. And it wasn't as good. The $3 million job they did wasn't as good as my 50 grand job would have done. So just to let you know, sometimes money does not buy a good show. <laughs> Even That's if you have it, you, don't, you shouldn't spend it. Yeah, you, they could have tried mine first and been happy with it, but okay. So hmm. anyways, that show did last. Uh, they said there was a three to five year um, uh, life span on the show just because that's what they do with shows, three to five years. And it lasted about four and a half years. And then the ship that it was on, they uh, repositioned to Europe where it was no English-speaking passengers, and so they cut out the show. Mm. Uh, but it was a heck of a show. It was really fun. And one of these days, I've got the videos, and I'll show them. Uh, not quite yet, but we've got, I've got all the versions where I brought in all the different magicians. And, uh, and then I'll tell you the story about how I wrote the show and then they rewrote it to put people in. And that's a whole nother thing. They put actors in that I didn't originally have. Wait a minute. Uh, so you were the producer of the whole thing. And you, of course, had booked the, the acts to come in. And you were performing, I guess, yes. kind of as the MC of the, uh, uh, of the carnival. Yeah, there's a character about the end, which I wrote, a, a grandson of a dead <laughs> magician. And he, and he appears as a skeleton. And he comes to life, right? Okay. And he basically, you know, and, and it was, and we did that. But then they added all these other characters that I didn't have in there. They being the the ship, the Norwegian well, the ship, because they bought the idea. Uh huh. They're the they, ones paying for it, so they feel they, they can do anything they want. So they could do that. Uh, I was not happy about it, um, but and we argued, and you know, it's just a regular thing. It's the process. I call that. That's the word I hear in entertainment that I've learned. The process. Wait a minute, you just lost a million. It's part of the process. Oh, so that's the excuse to screw up. It's part of the process. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so I guess, uh, yeah, it, it was, you know, it, it end, still ended up being the number one show in the fleet, uh, the best uh, scored show among the passengers. That's all they cared about. Uh, and we did better than all the other sort of like Jersey Boys type shows and everything. We, we had the most highest scores, and so I was real proud of it. As I recall, didn't you swap out acts from time to time? It wasn't the uh, same group of people the whole time. No, matter of fact, uh, it was my wife who uh, we met uh, t the clairvoyance, mm -hmm. which I'm sure you're familiar with. Yes. Uh, Tommy and Tommy uh, Ten and Emily and Emily. Uh, we met them in Germany and my wife said, you know what? They would be good for the ship show, the, the illusion. And I, and I didn't really know much about them, but she looked them up and this, and, and I sort of went, I'm not sure, you know, I'm not so sure, but I took her advice and sure enough, they were the hit of the, the whole thing. And, mm -hmm. and they sort of credit us in being their first venture into a United States, uh, performing facility. So we, uh, uh, they were the first ones and we had Sean Paul and Julianne Fay. We had Law Sander, James DeMere, Alain New, Bruce Gold, and a host of others. So it was really a good show. Yeah. I remember talking to you about that way back when, and it was, uh, uh, and, and Tommy Ten and uh, Emily were going to be moving on. And you said they're going to be looking for a mentalist and to perhaps put together something. And I was going to send you a, a video on that. Remember that? Right. And then right. after that all came about, then you say, well, it's a good thing it didn't work out because they didn't tell you, but apparently they were looking for someone exactly like the, the, the clairvoyance, the, someone who was a two person. They didn't want a, mi a mind reader or a mentalist. They wanted a two person. They wanted a clone of them. Well, once they got a taste of it, yeah, you know, uh, and there are, you know, duo, uh, you know, there's great, the Evisons, there's a, there's a bunch of them, yeah. but for some reason they like the style and, you know, apparently, I, you know, there's a few things that, that Tommy and Emily have that nobody else has. Uh, just because they're different from a few other people. And so they really wanted to find somebody. But what they learned, corporate learned, uh, is they couldn't, you know, try and, uh, ha they wanted to have acts and go, okay, can we just make a copy of that act? You know? Mm -hmm. And I'm like, no, it doesn't quite work that way. <laughs> In fact, it will never work that way. Now, there are copies. We've all seen copies of Lance Burton. We've seen copies of Jeff McBride. We've seen copies of... Doug Henning way back in the day, but they, you know, but no way, it just doesn't work. It never does, never will. Right. You have to have that it factor. You have to be a 
a character, a person, or an act, I guess, and uh, which would differentiate. I mean, there is no other Jeff Hobson. There is no other Lance Burton. I mean, everyone is, uh, people are trying to, to clone the success, and they think that the success is the act. And no, it is you, you know. Yeah, yeah. and, and I, I think eventually people figure that out uh, once they try it out. I've had, you know, I don't know. I've had a number of people over the years, decades, come up to me and go, oh, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. You helped send me to college because I, I uh, took your card and mouth and all your lines and everything, and I studied it, and I did it at all these places. And I'm looking at them like, I, and I don't get why they think that that's a compliment. <laughs> uh, and I just went, I go, well, I go, you owe me 10000 bucks. You know, what? I go, well, you, you took you you made money you sent it through i go i think ten thousand is fair and they all go oh, oh, oh. <laughs> they freak out oh, oh. you know they, they still yeah. don't get it though no that's true um i uh, had things like that happen in one particular case actually had um i was writing a book uh jamie salinas and i on a on a seance uh, book and uh we put them in lecture notes and we were going to flesh them out and we delivered this to the my invention and someone then took those and made it a book and credited us and sent us free copies said thank you so much for the ideas and <laughs> copied it verbatim and everything and made that into a book and added some more things it's kind of like Ooh, okay <laughs> you're welcome but you owe me no, that's it well yeah well, you know, here's the thing. I always say when people don't get it, I go, look, I've got this really cool recipe that I made up for a cake. And the cake's great, and it's different from everybody else's, and it's yummy, and everybody loves it. Well, then you take that recipe, and all of a sudden you market it, and you make money on it. I go, wait a minute. That's my recipe. Yeah, the milk you can buy at the store, the sugar you can buy at the store, everything you can buy, but I put it together in this, which makes it a special thing that tastes different, and you just took it, and you're making my. I go, and so then they sort of go, oh, I see. Yeah, it's a recipe. <laughs> Someone left the cake out in the rain, and it <laughs> took so long to bake it. <laughs> you know yeah. what? I would not never sing again, uh, really. That's it. Don't, yeah. don't ever do that. That's it. That's it. Thank you. <laughs> Good <laughs> advice. Good advice. Uh, you just dated yourself too. So. <laughs> Boy, did I? <laughs> well, going going back, uh, still well, along that line, I was thinking about the people who are the producers and telling you what to do and how the show should be written. And as I recall also that you had told me later, this is not my decision. I cannot hire you. I'd like to put you in. However, it's there are people who are actually the money behind it who are making the decisions. I can only put you in front of that. And I think uh, a lot of times people don't recognize when they're trying to get booked for a show, they are talking to the wrong people. They may be, yeah. I mean, not that I was talking to, to the wrong person being talked to you, but you were up front and saying, hey, I'm not the one, it's going to be somebody else, but I can't get to those people. And sometimes you can't, you have to have an agent or somebody else well, to go and through. Well, that's another factor of the illusionarium is that, you know, I became, they, they made me the de facto facto agent to book these acts, yeah. <laughs> I have to, quote, submit them, and then they look at the video, and then they decide their entertainment director goes yay or nay. Well, then it got to that point in their business model that they said, for whatever reason, could be a lot of different reasons, is they said, oh, you, we have to take multiple bids now hmm. from other agents. Wow. You know, you and who, and now we have to take at least three. So now there's wow. a, so I'm like, well, you know, I go, wait a second, you've got success. It was your idea. <laughs> you know, yeah, and I, I know all the acts, and I'm sure you got other agents that know the acts, but they don't know the show. They haven't seen the show, you know, uh, and so, and that was when it started to, that was after the third, going into the fourth year, and we could see it sort of crumbling, you know, uh -huh. and too many cooks in the kitchen always ruins it. Yeah, wow, interesting. Now, around that time, actually, prior to that time, is when you were actually doing Carnival Wonders with uh, Mark and Ginger, right? Yes. And uh, although that started in Vegas, then went to Atlantic City, and where else did you go with that? Well, we, we uh, yeah, we started uh, in Atlantic City in two different places, uh, Trump Marina and Trump Castle. Mm -hmm. uh, then we, I think we came back and did Caesar's Magical Empire. Then we went back out to, then we went to Reno, and we're at the Flamingo, and then we went to the large, uh, ended up at the large uh, one. What was that called? The big, the Reno Hilton, Hilton which is Reno now Hilton. the yeah. Sierra. Mm -hmm. uh, and, of course, that was huge. That was That's huge. the largest stage in the country. I mean, it, it they was. put a 747 oh. there. <laughs> okay, I, here's a 
here's an interesting story. So no, hardly anybody knows that on stage right, they built a two bedroom apartment. Now that's how big this stage is. They yeah. actually built an apartment for, uh, the, uh, for Frank Sinatra on his last tour. Cause that's like one of the last places he played. And so he says, well, if I'm going to be there for whatever, a month or whatever it was, he wants an apartment bill. <laughs> on stage. On stage. So all he has to do is open the door and like 30 steps and he is on stage. Wow. Now, I had that room. That was my dressing room. And sure enough, it looked, you know, you're backstage all black, you know, and then you have a key and you open his door. And sure enough. You know, it's a room, it's a sofa, it's a TV, it's the whole room, it's the bedroom, it's the shower, it's the, the it's everything's there. You would never know that you're backstage, right? Wow. Amazing, amazing. Uh, and so uh, I had that room. Now, that is, at the time, uh, it was either the world's largest stage, second, maybe second only to, I think it was Singapore or Shanghai, had just a little bit bigger of a stage, but it pretty, pretty huge. Well, you, I was in costume, and it's the beginning of the Carnival of Wonders show on a particular night. And, I, and of course, like 10 minutes before the curtain goes up, I have to walk around the backstage off to the side. And it's like, takes, it takes you a long time to walk it because it's just forever, right? Yeah. So now I realize, as I'm about to go on, the overture's playing, and I realized I forgot my hat in the dressing room. Oh, on the other side, the stage. And I realized that this special effect we're doing, we're rolling down a poster of me. I have to have that hat on or else it doesn't match. Right. So I basically heard the overture, which lasts like a minute. And I said, oh, and I, yeah. you know, expletive. Expletive. <laughs> so I'm like rolling like a bat out of hell all the way back. <laughs> Go into the room. I have to unlock it. <laughs> Grab that. <laughs> Run all the way around. I get to the place where I'm supposed to be, but now I am so out of breath. I'm supposed to be still and in a frozen position. Yeah. <laughs> and also I'm going, <laughs> 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 uh, and, and I'm sure from the front people going, wow, that poster's moving. I don't know what's going on, you know, but, uh, uh, but yeah, I've never been more panicked in my life on a queue, stage queue than that one. But I'll remember it as long as I live. I remember an MC one time, it was one of the funniest gags who came in from stage right over there as they'd introduced him and he was carrying a little lunch bag and about halfway to the, to the center, he stopped and open up the bag and start eating a sandwich and put it back and then walk the rest of the way to center stage. It was so far to get there. You're like, oh, yes, exactly, exactly. Well, I had heard also, I believe, uh, was it Mark Halen or someone who actually had like a 737 or some jet that was back behind there that they kept for a long time? I mean, they still had room for other kinds of stuff. He didn't have to move it. It's kind of like, okay, well, we'll get it some other year. Okay, uh, to be to be... Perfectly honest, it, it, it was a model yeah. of a 737 with shortened wings and shortened fuselage. So it wasn't a full-size plane, mm -hmm. but yes, this was a big plane. Mm -hmm. And they used it for a show called, I believe it was Hallelujah Hollywood, I think That's which right. ran for 20-some-odd years at the Reno Hilton, where the finale of the show, uh, they revealed this big plane and they had all the people inside dancing and, you know, the windows and every, the pilot, you know, the whole bit. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, you know, that it was already there. So when, I, I, I think, I hope Mark will forgive me for this, but, you know, the idea of producing a plane uh, where for 22 years, people already knew it was backstage mm -hmm. in a show, People really weren't that shocked uh, at the production of a plane that we go, oh, yeah, that plane we saw that a couple of years ago in a show here, you know. It's so, still there. You know, I, I think it was uh, it was good for advertising. I sure. think it was good for that sort of thing that, you know, but, uh, yeah, it was it was an interesting time. Well, what happened to the Carnival of Wonders? Personally, I think that was one of my favorite touring shows ever, and I'm including Copperfield and others. You know, I'm sorry to other friends. I may be dissing their show, but that was just delightful on so many different levels. It had a roller coaster of emotions. Uh, the illusions were mystical. I still have no idea how that curtain all went into your top hat at the end. I mean, all those kinds of things. It's like, this is a marvelous show. What happened to that? 
Well, you know, it's like like anything else. Uh, you know, uh, a Runs show a course. has has a, has a running its its its, its time. Um, we, uh, you know, we had we had our time, and then it tried to be. You know, even if something works, a show in a place for a while has to change. You know, they always have a different show. Mm-hmm. Entertainment's changed. You know, like I say, the Holly, Holly, Hollywood 22 year run. Wow, you could do that. Today, you couldn't do that. You ah, couldn't have good a, point. Good point. You know, you couldn't have a show that runs forever because uh-huh. uh, it just, people are want something different all the time now. You're, yeah. you're catering to people's, you know, seven minute uh, attention span or seven second ten- attention span. Mm-hmm. And so now uh, we were at the cusp of the sort of that, that thing where, okay, the show, good. It had its run. It's great. Uh, and we did revive it at a few casinos a few years later and a few years later. Uh, we did one in 2007 and another one in 2000, I think, maybe 11, I think was a lot, maybe, um, or maybe even later than that. And uh, we did a few revivals of it. And it was it's fun. It was a very fun, fun show. Our chemistry between the three of us were very balanced. You know, you had the yeah. magician, the damsel, and the funny guy, and it all did a... You know, and Mike Caveney sort of said it was a Leroy Tom on Bosco sort of a thing. I, I just going to say, I couldn't say it fast <laughs> enough. Exactly. Yeah. And uh, so, you know, it was, I, I just think it was the right show, the right time with the right chemistry. And we had, you know, guys that were very smart and Joni Spina, uh, you know, choreography. And she found most of the music and we, uh, which she's brilliant. She was brilliant at that. Mm-hmm. I miss her so much. And um, uh, we had... Alan Wakeling was one of our consultants. Wow. Uh, Jim Steinmeier was a writer. So, you know, when you put all the yeah. good stuff in a pot, that recipe thing I'm yeah. talking about, that's where you get a good show when you put the right recipe together. Yeah, you can't go wrong with a group like that. Wow. Wow, that's true. Uh, before I forget about it, there was one little uh, part also that few people know about nor remember, uh, and that is what uh, you and Michael Mode had put together many years ago was that app on apple that was uh, uh something back when we had the what was that the not the ipad or iphone before the ipad it was the uh, there was something else that was uh, well, you uh, could do it on, yeah it was on, it was an ipad or ipod or you could do it on your phone either one it worked on any of those it was called best jokes ever yeah how'd you develop that talk a little bit about well, development you know, of that with you and mike michael we we, we went on you know we, michael and i were always we're, we're sort of like we like a lot of jokes you know we just always we're always and we had a lot of books and I had a massive library that I got rid of hence uh, since then but and we're always calling each other with jokes you know and uh we looked online and I was trying to check out you know joke apps and we're like these are really bad the jokes are bad we know they're bad uh these are these are so and we realized that the vast majority of joke books and joke apps are written or compiled rather by people who really don't know how to tell a joke or really have not been on stage, you know, mm. uh, and, or, and know a good joke from a bad one just by reading it. Yeah. And so we said, boy, you know what? We, we know better what, what jokes are good and what aren't. So why don't we think about putting something together? And we found a developer and said, look, we want it, we want it this way, this way, this way. Can we put it all together? Michael and I spent about a year and a half compiling, writing this, all the jokes. And it was it was a great thing because you could search any joke, and there was three different levels. There was the clean and sort of like the iffy uh, joke, PG, and then there was the dirty version we had, you know. But at least you knew what you were reading before you read it. And different categories, like with medicine or doctors, yes, or and you could search any. Golf it was totally or anything, searchable. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and so now we we actually have it again. Oh, yeah. Uh, it's it's actually on. Um, if you look up on the Apple Store best jokes ever and look up Jeff Hobbs and Michael Mode, you'll find uh, the actual PDF or the actual uh, uh, app where you can actually get it for, I think, uh, I don't know, what is it, a few dollars, four dollars or something like that. Mm-hmm. And it's the same thing. You can actually search it and it's now more in a little bit of a book form, a little more, you know, fi- searchable and whatnot. But yeah, and, uh, and Michael wants to do a printed version of it as well. Well, I was going to ask, I, I was trying to refresh my memory, as I recall, uh, it, it, 
it wasn't someone telling a joke. You would actually read it. So in other words, you type in golf, and then you could read the joke. So it would be great for, like, MCs or whatever also. Sure, and, and the thing is you could save it to favorites. So if you mm-hmm. had, you know, look, you could do it in, like, a couple minutes. Say, oh, I want jokes on sports. And you want, oh, I want that one, that one, that one, that one. And in a list, it would have just those. So you can look at it and just have those jokes. It was br- brilliant. It really was. Uh, uh, we, uh, it's, it's sort of in that genre now. You can actually search for his favorite jokes. Did you make any money off of it? Uh, a little no, bit? You know, I think if I remember correctly, it, the, the development of the app at the time, the first one was like 7,000 bucks, and I think we made three. <laughs> yeah, so, that's what I was thinking back then. It cost a lot because it was kind of on the front edge of uh, all this thing and trying to get yeah, something. I understand. And then, and then when, you're, when you're an Apple developer, you've got the, the fees that you have to pay constantly to keep it up, and we're like, you know what? We, we're on the other things, both Mike and I, and we don't have time yeah. to keep that up, and so we just let it lapse until recently. Now, that would have been, was it in the 90s or was that early 2000? I think 90s. No, I, I think that was, boy, actually, I don't know now. I have to, I have to relook at that. I, I really think it was in the 2000s, I think. I think it was, it was back when the iPad had the, uh, the shuttle or sh- shuffle thing, you know, that was, yeah. uh, and for listening to music, you can only listen to the, your, uh, it was before the iPad. What am I trying to say? That they, it had a, uh, I, well, like an iPod, yeah, but it was just the iPod, just was music only kind of a thing, and there yeah, were some other... iPod shuffle or whatever, yeah, but but you didn't have the screen. You had to have the screen for it, so... Correct, yeah. Uh, yeah. Interesting. Uh, and I'm sure you had other kinds of projects and things that you were working on at the end of the time. And speaking of projects, then one of the things that I think is exciting, I didn't know that you were such good and close friends with Marvin Roy, which developed, I guess, later into uh, Marvin's... What's, what's the name of the club? Marvin's Magic Theater. Marvin's Magic Theater, which is in Santa Barbara, or where are you? La Quinta, California, uh, which has nothing to do with the hotel chain. Nothing it, Denny's, it, nothing to do with Denny's. Nothing to do with Denny's, nothing. La Quinta, California, and it's uh, a part of the Palm Springs, Coachella Valley. So if you're in Palm Springs, we're about 40 minutes from Palm Springs going toward Arizona. Okay. And that was developed when and how? Well, uh, Gary Butler who is a marvelous person, a good friend that I've known for years. He was a friend uh, friend of magic. Talk about a guy who really needs <laughs> needs his, uh, you know. Day in the sun? His There's credit. Recognition. Yeah. His credit. <laughs> is that he started, he was one of the guys that started uh, A1 Multimedia, which became a, you know, A1 Magic Media, which of course started the trend with L&L almost at the same time. Uh, But he started that, and most of the lectures that are done through A1 Multimedia are done at Gary's, one of Gary's houses. Hmm. He's got this huge bar with people sat around. He did all the stuff, you know, all the things there. That was with Mike Maxwell. Right. Uh, And he also then uh, helped a number of other magic uh, projects get up and running. And over the years, he always said to me, he goes, Jeff, if you ever want to open up a club or something, let me know. I'll help you. I'm like, oh, yeah. And I turned it down for like 11, 12 years just because I was doing stuff. I'm on Vegas. Well, why would I want to do that? Mm-hmm. And so finally, a few years back, he mentioned it again. And I said, oh, OK, let's let me go find out what this La Quinta or Palm Springs is. So I came here and I went, wow, this is great. You know, this is wonderful. It's a great location. And we looked around, found a place. And next thing you know, he uh, he said, OK, let's do this. And I'm like, uh, OK, let's do this, I guess. And next thing you know, I was right at the tail end of doing seven years with The Illusionist. uh, And um, I figured uh, it coincided seven years to the day, New Year's Eve, at the Sydney Opera House. I decided I started there seven years. And seven years later, I'm at the same spot. And I said, that's a good that's a good run. Good bookends. Seven years, seven years, Sydney Opera House, Sydney Opera House. I go, that's good. I'm going to take a leave and do this. And so I've been here now for, uh, you know, going on a couple of years now uh, and getting the, the theater up running. And, uh, you know, it's we've we're number one on TripAdvisor. We're we're doing well and uh, people are all waiting for uh, the fall to reopen again. So is it similar to the Magic Island? By the way, it, it just occurred to me. Newport Beach was the name of the place, I believe. Yeah. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Correct. Yeah. So Newport. is this kind of like the venue there? Uh, no, no, it's, it's, it's different. Uh, this is a very contemporary, uh, new, newer, uh, looking location. 
that just has a small fall magic shop where you oh you come in and people are confused you mm -hmm. know where they look well there's a little magic shop you know it's like you know tw 16 feet by 12 feet that's it you know and yeah and then all of a sudden it magically gets revealed into a bar and then that bar finally you go oh this is where the show's at i go no 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 go into the back and then where so it's kind of like a chicago magic lounge with the laundromat in a way sorta sorta okay. yeah 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 it, yeah it, it is in a way like that where you don't know where you're at at first i love the chicago magic lounge though the fake laundromat i think that's brilliant yeah yeah, completely different. Obviously, going into a magic shop, you think the idea is, well, this is going to be magic as opposed to going into doing your, your laundry. I wonder about how many people actually do carry baskets in there thinking, I'm going to try that laundry bag. They just moved into the neighborhood. They go, wait a minute, this thing isn't working. <laughs> you know, I don't know. I don't Because it's it's quite um it's quite realistic. I mean, yeah. you know, really, I guess it was a laundry at one time, right? Correct, correct, yeah. And then they gutted it uh, completely out of there. In yours, did you gut that and then build from that on up? Or how would that? We were, this is part of a big, big, uh, this is the busiest intersection in the entire Palm Springs Valley, Coachella oh. Valley, where we're at. But there's so many stores and restaurants around, we can get lost. Somebody, people are always looking, where are you located? Well, we're right right down the hall from uh, the Century Movie Theaters. And they go, oh, it's a storefront of a mall, which had nothing at it. It was just total uh, concrete, nothing mm -hmm. there. The, it was a 12,000-foot golf center. Hmm. huge like the biggest in the entire valley uh and they and we we basically took six thousand square foot which i find out from dale Heinemann. he says you know it's bigger than the castle i go the castle's smaller than six thousand square foot he goes yeah i go really i go it, to me the castle seems like it's a massive mansion it goes on and on yeah but it doesn't you know yeah. when you think about it, the rooms are very small very tiny very crunched together and uh, and I didn't know that, but yeah. So we're we're just a hair bigger than the Magic Castle as far as square footage, and uh, yeah. And so we're uh, you know we got restaurants all around us, so we do well with that. There's the other uh, Magic Castle East or wherever it is that Milt Larson had built. Santa is that Barbara. anywhere near you? Yeah, yeah. Santa Barbara. Okay, uh, and that's a much smaller venue than yes. than all of those. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so is yours also where you are doing all the booking to for people to coming in or have you got an entertainment director or is handling that? Or are you doing a little bit of everything? No, I'm pretty much the multi cook and bottle yeah, washer. Yeah, do everything. Uh, we hire, you know, we have a sound. I don't do sound or lights. I, I can do some of it. I'm not. <clears throat> we have actually quite advanced moving lights in here. And uh, I wouldn't know how to. You know, I'm not a techie that way. Yeah. And so I have somebody else, luckily a few people in the Valley that are, have a, we have a good theater, you know, crowd here that love its theater. And so, uh, it's not too hard to find people that are good, mm -hmm. uh, lighting sound. Um, and, uh, I could give you like an hour on how this place is built and how it started bigger and kept getting, and again, uh, you know, we're sort of fighting with people that don't know uh, theater. And so I'm saying, no, no, we need the seats this way. Well, no, we they could be this way. I go, no, 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 they got to be the, you know. Theater, yeah. and, and so you're dealing with people that don't know theater. And this was like the first theater that a lot of people designed and built. And so you're sort of teaching them. Mm -hmm. I know there's, there's a reason why you have it the way I'm telling you. Uh, and so finally, uh, but with, with unfortunately because of... Uh, ADA uh, regulations of how big bathrooms have to be and right. what we lost wheelchair accessible and all that and all that sort of stuff we lost a lot of room that was officially drawn up by the architects uh, and here's the other thing uh, you know uh, the uh, the initial thing was oh yeah we got one restroom out in the lobby and I said well what about for the axe what the restrooms need an act backstage I mean I mean the restrooms you know actually the, the, restroom yeah need a restroom backstage what and I go yeah and then my wife correctly said, well, we have men and women, so we need two restrooms backstage. And they all went, oh, no, you know, this is only, <laughs> what are you talking about? And I go, no, no, it's true. And so now we get rave reviews from all the entertainers coming in saying, this is one of the best places because you we got refrigerators in the room. This is like a real freaking place to, yeah. to do a good show at. So. Just one scale down from Frank Sinatra's stage right. Yes. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that was a uh, nice room. I had a piano and everything in it. I love it. <laughs> so why uh, I named that after Marvin Roy? Uh, Marvin was a friend then of yours. I mean, of all the names you could have come up with. 
Well, here's what, so, so we designed the place. It's in the workings. We haven't come up with a name yet. And I was thinking, you know, uh, you know, uh, Palm Springs Magic Theater, La Quinta Magic Variety Arts Theater, you know, all these names were coming to me. And the, uh, the, the person, we have a local IBM SAM ring that's named after him. You know, mm. it's the Marvin Roy ring. Yeah. And I got to know Marvin really well, and we're have, going out to dinner, and he's very excited that a new place is going to be built. Oh, this is going to be great. Uh, and he's, oh, we'll have to have, we'll be able to have steak dinners at midnight. And I'm thinking, he's thinking 1950s cabaret in Europe. <laughs> and I'm, I'm trying to let him down nicely that, no, oh, you're going to have the big orchestras with the trombones? Like, eh, no, but keep <laughs> keep on that track, you know, whatever. Yeah. So. So unfortunately, we couldn't, you know, he, that's a whole other story about when he first saw the place. That's pretty funny. Uh, but, uh, oh, and I lost my track. Where was I? <laughs> about why and how you named it, Marvin. Oh, yeah. So uh, one day we're, we're uh, uh, from Gary. Gary says, I know what we're going to call it. And I said, what? He goes, Marvin's. And I went, of course, that's what we're going to call it. Yeah. Marvin's Magic Theater. And so it just one day we went, yeah, hell yeah. The whole thing is now you know, sort of like electrical sort of themed up in the front and whatnot. And we show videos of Marvin before show and we show his photos out in the lobby. And yeah, and so it's an homage to Marvin and that's his seat right there. I see mm -hmm. it and he sat at all the time on a Sunday afternoon. He loved it. A real tribute to him. All right, yeah. well, I do want to hear that story though about when he first came to see the place. <laughs> okay, so... <clears throat> We have a huge photo of Marvin when you when the door opens. I mean, it's twelve foot tall. So, I mean, you can't miss it. it Billboard takes size, the whole room, okay. right? <clears throat> and then on the opposite wall is is Carol, okay, in the nineteen fifties. Mm -hmm. Single photo of her. Okay. So he comes in, and he doesn't say anything about the place, but he makes a beeline to that picture, and he says. That was taken in 1974 by blow, and he goes on for 10 minutes about that photo, but nothing about the place. <laughs> okay. Okay. And then I turn around and I, I, I point to the picture of Carol and I say, look, and he look, goes up to him and goes, who's that? And I, but here's the thing. It wasn't because he really didn't recognize her. It's because I Photoshopped the background out of it. Oh. So, so he saw the photo and didn't recognize the overall photo. But he still said, who's, it threw him off. He couldn't said, place it. I said, that's Carol. He goes, no, it's not. I go, yeah. I said, I, I sort of fixed up the, <laughs> the hair and eh, it's Carol, it's Carol. So, you know, I think I just threw him off and he yeah. was sort of out of his element where he was expecting one type of club and he got totally 180. And then after the show, the first opening night, he's walking out and he hasn't said anything you know about the place yet and i said said marvin so what do you think and he can't and he put his hand on my shoulder he goes jeffrey he says it needs a little sizzle <laughs> and i said marvin i don't even know what that means I, I, what does that mean you know i i don't know but it was but finally he got you know he got over the shock of it not being Red velvet, crushed red velvet, a band, and you know something uh, from the seventies. Yeah, something for out of the seventies or sixties or fifties, and he finally went, "Oh yeah, this is a nice place," and then he loved it. You know, so but it was interesting taking it. Well, okay, the guy's not was ninety four at the time. Yeah, he's got a right to think however he wants to think and say sure. whatever he wants to say. He's been there, seen it, and done it all around yeah. the world. And, I, and yeah. we love him for it. And, he, and believe me, every day he came in, he sat. We have a place called Marvin's Corners here. He sits down, tables all around, and then I make the announcement. I go, by the way, Marvin's, you're wondering who Marvin's? See that picture? That's 1976. That's Marvin over in the corner. Everyone goes, oh, you know, he's on the Ed Sullivan show twice and Johnny Carson and the Tonight Show. And he, uh, he loved the attention. He just loved it. And so... I think he went out with a smile on his face. I think one of the funny things is it just occurred to me then also about the relationship where he, of course, later did the magic jeweler for Liberace and you do Liberace type of stuff. <laughs> so he had to love you for that. I think that's where they, back in the 80s when we met, I think that's where they sort of fell in love with me because I was doing the, you know, hi, how are you? Isn't this wonderful? Yeah, you know, <laughs> that sort of thing.
<laughs> so yeah, and uh, yeah, yeah, and uh, and we've we've you know we've been friends ever since uh, 1988. So it was great. Well, I'm going non chronological, but before we wrap up, there is something I, I do need to ask, and that does a, a large part of your life. You're talking about the illusionists, where most of the world knows you and had the opportunity to where you travel to see them rather than them coming to America to see the shows you've been in in Vegas and Atlantic City, et cetera. And so you're going elsewhere. Was there any place that comes to mind that was really one of your favorite locations, shows you've done, uh, places you've visited, uh, maybe it was a museum or food or uh, something that kind of comes to mind? Yeah. Um, well, you're talking about on the Illusionist tour. On the Illusionist, during that time, yeah, from bookends between the Sydney to yeah. Sydney. There, well, there's so many places that we toured. Yeah. And the the problem with Europe, and, and I'm, it's a, it's a, it is what it is, we had to have a translator most of the time. Mm -hmm. So the shows really weren't as like they are in America where everything's quick and you have to have that translation thing. Good point. I did have one translator that was a funny guy and we had a blast where I would say something and then I'd cuss in their language and I, oh, that's wrong. What did I say? You know, and, and sort of make it, and it was so, <laughs> we had a lot, that, that was sort of like the special time of that tour where you got to be family with people from all over the world. Uh, translators and bus drivers and everybody that you felt a camaraderie uh, mm -hmm. and making a show out of a difficult situation in many times. Now, of course, the you can't. Carlo is it Carlo Vivari? Carlo Vivari. I might be saying it wrong. It was in Czech, one of the most gorgeous places on the planet. I didn't even know it was there. I would go back just to see Carlo Vivari and perform there. It was just where was that? You said it was Czechoslovakia or where was it? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Czech Republic now, whatever. Yeah. But but yeah, that was one stop and it was just gorgeous. So I remember that. I will remember that all my life because it was like the one place you just were totally in awe the entire time. Just gorgeous. Um, and uh, for best audiences, though, if you yeah. want to do for that seven year time, I, the best audiences were two cities. They were all both in America, Costa Mesa, California, and Tampa Bay, Florida. Okay. Tampa. I would not have guessed either one of those. I would not have either, but the reason why I say that, we've been there now two or three times on tours, and each time it's it's more laughter, more applause, more appreciation than anywhere else we've we've been. And why do you I think that know, is? I have no idea. I don't get it. Because I've heard people say, for an example, and since you're from Michigan, you know, audiences in Minnesota, they, you, I've heard somebody say, well, you know, there's an audience out there because they cast a shadow. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, but whereas there are other places, but they just appreciate it in a different way. And yeah. so perhaps uh, Tampa and Costa Mesa then also just appreciate it in their own way. Yeah, they're very vocal and appreciative. And, you know, it's almost like when you write a script, they were supposed to applaud. They do. You know, it's like everything gotcha. was done the way you think. The most difficult, most stressful time, I'll, I'll leave it. Th this is one story that was a pretty good one. I'll, I'll leave Broadway, opening night uh -huh. on Broadway, our first season, first time. Everyone, of course, is nervous. Right. I don't know I'm supposed to be nervous because I never thought as a magician, I'm going to perform on Broadway. Well, it's just another gig. But then right. it's, it's sort of like sunk in. Oh, crap. This is Broadway. Broadway. <laughs> and we're opening night. Oh, this is important. Oh, oh, and then you start getting a little bit nervous. And then you realize, oh, opening night. Also, all of the all of the uh, critics are sitting there and they tell you where they're sitting. Oh, yeah. He, New York Times is there. And blah, I'm like, oh, oh, well, we have this beautiful box that's like 12 feet long, 10 foot high, 10 foot deep acrylic box that's hoisted up into the air. You can see through it. The lights are going through it. The dancers. This is the opening number. Right, I'm not on stage, and the idea is is that the curtain comes down, sort of like the Siegfried and Roy Tiger appearance yep. from the, the ceiling, yep. down, and then boom, there's the whole cast is in there, mm -hmm. and then I appear going, "Oh, the illusionist, ladies and gentlemen," and then I do my act, and everyone yeah. crawls out of the box. Okay, that's the way it's supposed to go. Yeah. So now, 
da 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 and I, I'm backstage, and, and I'm thinking to myself, gee, now, if anything goes wrong, I wonder what I should do. And I'm, it's a little bit late for me to be thinking this, <laughs> yeah. but it's like the overture is going, and people, the girls and boys are dancing underneath, eh, eh, da, 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 and the boxes, da 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 and I'm watching it just like everybody else in the audience going, oh, and then da, 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 back. And the music stops, curtain doesn't drop, nothing happens. Oops. Just nothing. <laughs> and it's silence. And nobody's moving. Nobody's doing anything. The audience is silent. And, and I just go, oh. <laughs> and, I, and I talk to one of the backstage techs, and I know what's going on out there in the front. They're going nuts, yeah. right? They're going absolutely nuts. And I said to one of the techs, I go, tell the guys out front I'm going out now. Because I just mm -hmm. went, you got to. You got to. So I walk out. It's silent. Spot hits me. And I say, I don't even know why I thought it. I go, you know, if that trick would have worked, it would have been so cool. <laughs> and everyone, I tell you, the New York audiences thought that they had been in a practical joke. And they all just roared and applauded and thought that was the great. And I'm thinking to myself. Oh my gosh. And I just said, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Jeff Hobson. And I just started to act like I would normally. Yeah. Nobody knew any different. And and all the owners just gave me the biggest hug afterwards because they went, you know, they're all like, oh, they're pulling out their hair. They knew what was supposed to happen. <laughs> yes. And so uh, I guess something happened in the back of my head and just went, I'm going to say something. You know, I don't yeah. know. That. But that was probably one of the most stressful moments in my career happened in the Illusionist show. Uh, next to running and getting your hat. And that was another one. <laughs> I, I'm actually reliving this. All. My, my heart is tightening. I got to go. <laughs> uh. Have you ever had celebrities or somebody uh, that have come to your shows? And I'm talking about uh, over your career in Vegas and around the world in different places that have kind of thrown you off a little bit. Someone's like, oh, my gosh, that's Pavarotti or whatever. You know, it's come to see. You know, um, you know, you know, I, I've never. We've had plenty of celebrities in the, sure. especially in Broadway. We've had, you know, Woody Allen, Allen, all that. Driver Streisand. Everybody shows up, right? I mean, yeah. they're all there. I, they come uh, backstage, I guess, too. Uh, sometimes, yeah. Uh, Phil Collins, a few other people, yeah. Uh, they all come backstage. Woody Allen did. Uh, I opened for a lot of people, stars and stuff, uh, over mm -hmm. the years too. Right. Um, I, I've, I've never had a thing that threw me off. Audiences have thrown me off. Like somebody accidentally booked me for Jethro Tull okay. as an opening act. Yeah. And I, I didn't even know the music of Jethro Tull. That's an uh, odd choice. I had no you idea, and... but I, as soon as I walked, I almost got to the microphone. And I, one guy and two, oh, more than that, a few people just said, get the F off stage, you know, <laughs> before I even said anything. Yeah. And, and right there, you know, so working for, with in different you know, uh, celebrities' audiences throw me off, but not the celebrities themselves. Yeah, right. Well, listen, as we wrap up then, the name of my podcast is called The Magic Word Podcast, and I'm always curious to know what it is that is the philosophy of life. What do you, what do my guests live by? What's important? Not necessarily a word. I don't mean like abracadabra, of course. I just mean like, and it doesn't have to be a word. It could be a sentence, a phrase, just a mantra, something that is important to you. Uh, it could be something important today that wasn't yesterday. I mean, what do you, when you wake up, what is, what keeps you going? Well, here's the thing that I, you know, always, it's, it's a cliche, but sometimes cliches are cliches because they're, you know, they're, they've proven to be true and mm -hmm. be true to yourself. So many people, they look in the mirror and they think they're looking at somebody different or they think there's somebody that they're not. Best mm -hmm. thing you can do is to go, you know what? I don't have this talent. I don't have this. I don't look like that. Let's get down to real. What are my pluses and be true to that? And once you really get down to a human, uh, you know, show that you're human and, and, and that sort of the thing, I think, uh, and the reality of who you are and accept it and enjoy it and be mm -hmm. happy with it, I think the world would be a much better place for everybody to interact with. Good way of looking at life. That's great. Jeff, thanks very much. I appreciate you being my guest. This has been just fantastic. It's been way too long for catching up here. It is my honor. I love you. This is great. So for the Magic Word Podcast, Scotty out. <laughs>
Okay. So for those of you who are hanging around a little bit and watching this video, I want to uh, uh, allow Jeff to show us a little bit. Since you are right now in the studio, you're in uh, at Marvin's, um, show us a little bit about what the place looks like. Okay. Well, I'm going to give you a quick little tour. Only should yeah. take about a minute to do this. Okay. Um, I am, as you can see, I was sitting in front of a green screen. Uh, this is our mid curtain, front curtain. I'm going to turn this around uh, because we have this as a, uh, uh, I don't know if you can see all the seats or anything. I can. How many people? It looks like it seats about uh, 180 people. It's about 129, actually. Probably a little more yeah. closer, but we've got, um, uh, you know, we've got this. The sound booth is up there, as you can see. I'm yep. not sure if I got this right, but up there is. Uh, oh, I see. There's Marvin and Carol. Silhouettes? Yes. Silhouettes with their lights between them. I like uh, that. And then we're going to go out this way. Let me see. And you're going to have to excuse because I have some uh, equipment here that's not really all that great. But uh, I think you can see the idea of, uh, oh, we've got a few things of, of uh, Copperfield there. Oh, there's an old thing. We go down this way. Uh, am I doing this right? Can you see yep, everything? Absolutely. Yep. Thank you. Okay, I see it looks uh, like a Hindu basket there. Yeah. And it's, it's usually on the ground over there in the corner. The tables are, of course, all taken up. We have a uh, piano. I was practicing a little bit of piano, of course, you know, with the Liberace thing. You know how that goes. Uh, <laughs> you actually play the piano. Uh, a little bit. Very little. Uh, yeah. And here's what the thing I was talking about, the bar with... The, with Marvin. Uh, mm -hmm. See? I mean, it's pretty huge, right? Uh, and that's so a beautiful that's, bar. Yeah, thank you. Uh, and oh, I like the top hat lights. Yeah, isn't that something? Isn't that cool? Uh, and then this is Marvin's corner. Uh, this is his quote, you know, magic is a love affair. Mm -hmm. And one of his signed posters there. <clears throat> and this is where he sat. He loved this. And of course, the Tashin book where he is, he's actually in that Tashin book, as you know, if you yep. own the book. And he always, uh, we always opened it up and explained to all the people there who he was and whatnot. Uh, and, um, yeah. And then let's see, we have a high end wine cellar here. Wow. Um, and then this is the secret thing of care. We see. Oh, and oh so that's the picture you photoshopped. Yes, exactly. So there's, I can Carol. see what he means. That doesn't quite look like Carol. I mean, it doesn't have the flowing hair and everything. And so, yeah. well, this is back where before she, she met him, this was in the back of her circus days. Oh, when she was still like on the ice capage thing? Exactly, exactly. And so uh, it's one of these doors that go up quick, but when they're... Uh, oh, so that's the entrance to the place with the magic shop you were saying, uh-huh. Yeah, exactly. We've got a few interesting things. We This is a... Uh, uh, this is Carrie Pollock's dematerialization chamber um, where, you know, somebody goes in and they disappear and then they will appear in the lobby. And then we just got some magic uh, paraphernalia props. So we have a little uh, thing right here. It's a, a little light bulb. I'm not sure you can see it now, but a little light I bulb. I do. Where the, a video of Marvin and Carol play inside of that light bulb. Oh, is that cool? Who yeah. made that? Did Carrie make that too? No, actually, Bill Smith made it uh, and donated okay. it. And all the, um, mm -hmm. uh, the Long Beach Mystics signed the back of it. So it's okay. pretty cool. And then we got, you know, regular sort of like uh, magic shoppy sort of things. Now, nothing's for sale there. That's really for display to make it look like a regular magic that's, shop. That's correct. And then uh, this is the Palm Springs Magic Club's library. Oh, interesting. Uh, which we so do they meet there? Uh, well, they don't yet, uh, but it's a possibility in the future uh, that we might have, have the meetings here. But right now, uh, it's a seasonal thing, the meetings. Okay. So, uh, but yeah. Well, we'll, and we'll Go ahead. When people come in, I assume that they pay there and then go inside? Or how well, do they? they pay online. Okay. You know, and then see, this is normally down. So this looks like a, uh, you know, when they when they come in, they just see this area, and it just looks. People don't even know that's a that's a that's a door. Right. And so uh, we finally let them in. We say, welcome, you know, welcome to Marvin's, and then boom, that's what they see. You know. Wow. So it's pretty cool. It's kind of like seeing the Spruce Goose. I remember the first time when I, you know, I'm talking about where you watch yeah. the movie and they've got a screen and they lift up the screen and boom, there's the real Spruce Goose. It was right. just amazing. Was like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it is pretty cool. But, uh, but yeah, so that's it. Um, you know, the rest of the place is just uh, backstage and rest. No close up room. Uh, well, the close up room actually is that piano. Oh, okay. You perform on top of the piano or yeah. what do you mean? 
Oh, yeah. Hmm. Uh, so in other words, like uh, here, I'll go, I'm going to come back here just so people second. can kind of stand around. They're not seated around there or anything. Well, no, we have these. Seats. Oh, I see there. Yes, we have these seats that are on top. They go around here. And yeah. these seats are at tables and they go around this way. Uh, I see. But then we have somebody here play the piano on, and then uh, this gets uh, put up here, uh, and then people do the close up right here at the piano. We're going to uh -huh. change it a little bit. Uh, we're going to change it up a little bit this season, uh, make it a little bit more of a stage for the close-up. Mm -hmm. But, uh, yeah, yeah, so it's, uh, it works out pretty well. Well, that sounds fantastic. And uh, for people who want to uh, get uh, reservations, what's the website? Where do they go to find that? Well, right now you go to uh, marvinsmagictheater.com, marvinsmagictheater.com. And Marvin, of course, is spelled M-A-R-V-Y-N. Uh, and theater with uh, R-E, not E-R. E-R, uh, marvinsmagictheater.com, uh, American spelling, that's correct. And, uh, yeah, we'll be, uh, our season will be opening up uh, in the, uh, in September here, uh, fall of uh, 2021. 2021. That sounds great. Well, good luck to you. That sounds uh, fantastic, and thanks for the short tour. I think everyone will enjoy that, too. So, uh, again, thanks for that little bonus we put here on the end, then, as well. Thanks, Jeff. appreciate you uh, being our guest here. You bet. It was my pleasure, my honor. Thank you very much, and we'll uh, see you all at Marvin's. Right. Well, this has been great. Thank you very much, Jeff. It's great to finally get a chance to sit down and talk with you for a proper conversation, uh, just the two of us. It seems like whenever we've gotten together, uh, you have been just in a whirlwind of activity with so many other people, and it's hard to kind of pull you off to the side just for a few moments for us to have a, a really great conversation like we had here. So it was great not only catching up, but to going in depth for a lot of listeners who may not know as much about you as they did before they listened to this podcast. So thank you, listeners, for tuning in, and thank you Jeff very much for your time, your words, and your friendship. It's been great, and I know everyone must have enjoyed this as much as I did. This was just a, just a joy, as I said. Well, listen, just a quick reminder, don't forget to subscribe to this uh, YouTube channel. We appreciate that, and uh, also, um, come back next week. We've got uh, another great guest who will be on the Magic Word Podcast. And so, until next week, stay well, get booked, and remember to be true to yourself and be the best you can be. For the Magic Word Podcast, <laughs> this is Scotty out. <laughs>